Uh, we left Habakkuk in a dilemma. Mm. The prophet was burdened by the wickedness and the sin of Judah and the acts of King Jehoiakim. And he would cry to God for his apparent lack of activity. And God's response was that he would show him a work that he would not believe. And you recall that we looked at how this first part of Habakkuk centres in Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 5. Let's remind ourselves of that. Let's go there now. Uh, Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5, where the prophet was told by God, Behold ye among the heathen and regard and wonder marvellously, for I'll work a work in your days which you will not believe, though it be told you. And you recall that the, the outworking of this in the time of Habakkuk was that God was going to raise up the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. It was a complete change in the world superpower at this time. Up until this point, it had been the Egyptians. And it was unbelievable that this would happen. And you recall how Paul quotes this verse in Acts 13. And he doesn't apply it to the Babylonians, but he applies this verse to the Romans. He applies it to A.D. 70. And so we, by extension, can take that multiple use of, of that same uh, verse and we can apply it to the times in which we live in, that we are looking forward to that day, that when the, the King of the North will come down, the time of the end and the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the establishment of his kingdom. Now, Habakkuk is a, a faithful prophet and he tries to work out why God would do this, why God would bring this wicked this violent nation against his own people. And in doing this, he, he calls upon the greatness of God. Let's have a look at this in Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 12. Habakkuk says, Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, mine holy one? We shall not die, O Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment, and O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. So Habakkuk declares that God is everlasting and he draws upon the name of God. He draws upon the name of Yahweh, uh, that he is my Elohim. Yahweh is his God, his holy one. And in calling upon the name of God, he's calling upon the character of God, isn't he? He's calling upon the plan and purpose of God to save. Let's remind ourselves, keep a marker of course in Habakkuk and come back with me please to Exodus and chapter six, because the name of God declares that God is a God of action, that he is a God who will do things. And, and this is centred in his name. Exodus chapter six, words that you will know well. Um, verse six, when the name of God is being declared uh, to Moses. Uh, verse six of Exodus six, wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, I am Yahweh. And I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will rid you out of their bondage and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. And I will take you to be my people and I will be to you a God and you shall know that I am Yahweh, your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land concerning the which I did swear to give it to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob and I will give you it for an inheritance. I am Yahweh. And as you've probably got uh, highlighted in your Bibles, we have seven I wills there. We have three I ams. And this is God's declaration to his people. This is the name of God. This is Yahweh, that he will save his people, that he will do this. And Habakkuk's grappling with this. He's trying to, to understand what God's ultimate purpose is. So when we go back to that verse that we've just looked at in Habakkuk, Habakkuk 1 and verse 12, having declared the name of God in the middle of that verse 12, he says, we shall not die. It's a similar phrase to what we've got in Malachi, Malachi 3 verse 6, I am the Lord, I change not, therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Now, there's some debate about the phrase, we shall not die. Um, some ancient texts put it that God shall not die, and others that we, the people, will not die. And I'd suggest that both are probably right. 
The fact that God does not die, that he's everlasting, that gives us confidence that his purpose will be fulfilled. And so as a result, we will not die. He he then refers to God as the mighty God. If any of you have got an interlinear or a marginal reference, you'll notice that this is the Hebrew tzur, which means rock. And the rock is something that, that's steadfast. It doesn't change. It's immovable. And that is the God that we serve. And reference to God as the God of the rock speaks of our salvation, doesn't it? The first time the word tzur is used, it takes us back to Exodus chapter 17, where Moses smote the rock and out came uh, the water. And Paul, when writing to the Corinthians, tells us that that rock that followed them in the wilderness was Christ our salvation. So the prophet understands the greatness of God. And in God's greatness, he also recognises the need to correct his people. So he says in verse 12 that thou hast ordained them for judgment. Yes, God is a merciful God. He's a gracious God. He's a long-suffering God. But he would by no means clear the guilty. And the prophet understood all this, but he still couldn't understand why it was needed to bring down the Babylonians to accomplish God's purpose. Verse 13, thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he. So here the prophet tries to expand on his argument. He says, God, you're a pure eyes. You, you can't look at evil and iniquity. And this is true. God dwells in light, which no man can approach unto. And the prophet argues, therefore, why are you allowing God, this wicked nation, to devour a nation that is more righteous than them? Yes, Judah's bad, but surely the Babylonians are, are much worse. Surely Judah's more righteous than the, the Babylonians. Why are you going to allow this. And the prophet continues this argument now to the end of chapter one. Let's have a look at it. It's in the section from verses 14 to 17. The prophet says, and make his men as the fishes of the sea, as the creeping things that have no ruler over them. They take up all of them with the angle. They catch them in their net and gather them in their drag. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. Therefore they sacrifice unto their net and burn incense into their drag, because by them their portion is fat and their meat plenteous. Shall they therefore empty their net and not spare continually to slay the nations? So the prophet likens the the rampage of the Babylonians to catching fishes in a net. Israel are the fishes and, and Babylon deploys its net to catch all of the fishes. And the angle that's referred to, well, that's the hook. That's the the fishing rod um, that they're gathered into this dragnet. And the prophet argues that Babylon will continue to do this. It makes them fat. They can benefit from the riches of the nations that they devour in the form of tribute and taxation. And the prophet asks, well, why, God, would you allow this to happen? Will Babylon empty their net? Well, the answer, of course, to that is no, they won't. Will they continue to slay the nations for their own benefit? And the answer to that, of course, is yes, they will. And in this section of the book, there is another little chiastic structure. It's in verses 14 to 17. It starts with with men and ends with uh, nations in verse 17. It then highlights how the ravenous nation takes all of them uh, with the angle. It makes them fat by what they take. They're then drawn into this net, this sort of enclosing of them um, through the actions of this nation. And the centre part is in verse 15. Therefore, they rejoice and are glad. Uh, And this rejoicing is from the oppressing nation. This rejoicing is from Babylon. Uh, And once again, they attribute their success to their gods. They sacrifice to their net. I don't know if you noticed that as we were reading it through. It's the idea of burning incense to their their dragnet. They're they're worshipping their successes and attributing it to their pagan gods, like we briefly touched on um, yesterday. 
And the world in which we live in today, it's the same, isn't it? Those that are in power, global businesses, capitalists, the richest people, the strongest countries, it's not enough for them what they have. They want more and more. They want to get richer and richer. And they rejoice in it. Um, a stat that I, I read suggests that just the five richest people in the world have the same wealth as the poorest three and a half billion. Shocking that, isn't it, when we think about it? The oppression of the poor, the inequality in society. When will it stop? You know, when the G7 or the G20 nations get together, how high up on their agenda is it to address the inequality with the poor and needy? If just a fraction of the world's money that is spent on armaments was spent on helping the poor, helping those that hunger, um, that would solve that problem. Uh, President Putin uh, of Russia, one of the richest people in the world, is he satisfied with what he's got? Well, no, he wants more, doesn't he? He wants to take more land, grow the power of his country. Come with me, please, to the Psalms, to Psalm 73. So we, we referred to Psalm 73 very briefly yesterday. And Psalm 73 really deals with the same issue that, that Habakkuk is dealing with. He's thinking about the prosperity of the wicked and the injustice of it. Psalm 73, verse 1, Truly God is good to Israel, even as such as with a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps were well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So that's the problem that the psalmist considers. And the language here in this psalm, it's very similar to the opening of Habakkuk, verse 4. For there are no bands in their death, that their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence, that's our word, Hamas, covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. And that's what we've just read about Babylon. They have more than their heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak uh, loftily. And this is a, a real issue for the psalmist and he comes down to verse 16 and he says that when I thought to know this it was too painful for me and this is how the prophet felt how could God allow this to happen why is the righteousness where is the righteousness where is the goodness of God in all this and, and this is one of the the key arguments isn't it against God atheists will say that if God is a loving and a caring God, why does he allow the wickedness that is in the world to happen? Why did he allow Hitler to murder the Jews or Pol Pot or other despots and so forth? Why does he allow this to happen? And of course, the psalmist answers that in verse 17. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their latter end. And Habakkuk now would have to wait and see what God's answer would be. Now, when I was a, a young lad, um, my father used to ask us kids questions. One of them he used to ask us was, um, who is the smallest person in the Bible? And the answer, of course, to that is Bildad the Shuite. Another question he used to ask was, which prophet broke his watch? And of course, the answer to that is Habakkuk, because he stood on it. But let's go back to Habakkuk chapter 2. And let's see how this reveals itself in the prophecy. Habakkuk 2 and verse 1. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the watch here is, of course, the, the watchtower. And all of God's prophets need to stand upon their watch. We all need to stand upon our watch and look out for the signs of the times and see and wait for God to answer. And sometimes the way that God works out his plan and purpose are ways that we're not expecting. There will be things that we don't understand and we need to wait and watch for it. Come with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 21, because we get very similar language in the, the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah 21 and uh, verse 11. 
The burden of Duma, he calleth to me out of Seir. Watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? The watchman said, the morning cometh, and also the night. If ye will inquire, inquire ye, return, come. So watchman, what of the night? And it's interesting that he calls out of Seir, which is the south. And we'll be looking at that when we get to Habakkuk chapter 3 in a few days' time. And the Babylonian dominion was like the night. And the Gentile times that we live in is the night. But remember, the morning does come and the night. And so we need to inquire. We need to return and come. So the prophet Habakkuk waits. He will now watch for the answer from God. And when he was to get that answer, he would be reproved. And the answer that he would get is that the very focus of this whole book, because the book of of Habakkuk itself is is a, a lovely chiastic structure. The book starts with the question, why does God tolerate injustice? And it ends at the end of chapter three with the perspective of faith, that it doesn't matter what happens, that we can still rejoice in the Lord and joy in the God of my salvation. And we've always seen how God's answer was to bring judgment through the Chaldeans. But in chapter three, we'll see the judgment that comes from God, that the mighty one from Mount Paran, the holy one coming. We then have a a focus on the the Babylonians, um, the complaints that uh, we've just looked at of Habakkuk. And tomorrow, God willing, we'll look at the five woes against uh, Babylon. And so right at the very centre of this book is chapter two, verses two to four, the answer that there is an appointed time and that the just shall live by his faith. And this is the very centre. This is the most important part of the prophecy and message of Habakkuk. So let's see then how this um, develops. Um, Habakkuk chapter two and uh, verse two. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. Now, the children of Israel were required to write the law upon tables of stone. Deuteronomy 27 tells us that, doesn't it? Thou shalt write upon the stones all the words of this law very plainly. And why did they have to do that? Well, it was to give the meaning. Uh, Habakkuk was required to do the same. And it's why we now, as successive generations on from the time of Habakkuk, we're living about 2,600 years after Habakkuk wrote uh, this, this, this prophecy, it's, we are able to benefit from this today. It was written on tables of stone that, that we might be able to, to read it. Isaiah was given a similar commission, wasn't he, in Isaiah 30 and verse 8, to go write it now uh, before them in a table and note it in a book that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. But Habakkuk wasn't just tied to to write it plainly upon tables, but it was so that he may run that readeth it. There was a a call to action here, a call to run. And the Proverbs tells us that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth unto it and is safe. And in the first century, this was literally a matter of life and death. To the believers. Let's have a look at it. Let's go to Luke chapter 21. Let's go to the, the Olivet prophecy and uh, the warning of the Lord Jesus Christ as to what was going to happen to Jerusalem. We know this was uh, fulfilled when the, the Romans came down in, in AD 70. Luke 21 and verse 21 says, Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains and let them which are in the midst of it depart out and let not them that are in the countries enter there too. So they literally had to run on reading and understanding the outworking of God's prophetic work. If they didn't do it, if they didn't run, they'd be trapped in Jerusalem. They'd be caught up in the siege of the Roman armies. And it's the same for us today, isn't it, brothers and sisters, that we have to run away from the influences of the things of this world. And we have to flee to the Lord. We have to flee to the strong tower. Because that time will come. 
Verse 3 of Habakkuk chapter 2. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. The ESV says, for still the vision waits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. It seems slow. Wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. And this is the answer to the question that Habakkuk started with, isn't it? In Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 2. Oh, Lord, how long? And the outworking of God's judgments always take time. We can think of the time of the flood that Brother Luke's been looking at, that period of 120 years before the flood came. There was a period of about 14 years between the first and the second invasion of the Chaldeans, of the Babylonians. From when Jesus gave the Olivet Prophecy around about AD 30, there was a 40-year gap to AD 70 when Jerusalem was finally taken. And today we are living in the end times, aren't we? In the time of the end. And some would suggest that the time of the end period started in 1917 when the British took Palestine and drove out the Turks. And we're still waiting for the outworking of that vision. It seems slow. Wait for it, but it will surely come. Let's go to the writer to the Hebrews, please, in the 10th chapter, because this verse is, as you all know, is, is quoted here um, in Hebrews chapter 10. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 10, let's pick up the context in verse um, 30. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And God has appointed a day to judge this world in righteousness. And it's in God's good time for this to happen. It's not for us to try to take matters into our own hands. It's to bring that God will bring about his own vengeance. Vengeance belongeth unto me. And the argument develops down to verse 36. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. And patience is one of the key characteristics of the faithful. It's patience in the outworking of the will of God. And so we can perhaps all ask ourselves a question. Are we patient, uh, brothers and sisters? That's not a characteristic that comes very naturally to me, as my wife will tell you. But are we, are we patient in our waiting for our Lord and Master. And then verse 37, and here's our quote from Habakkuk, for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. And the writer to the Hebrews here is again quoting the Septuagint. But did you notice the difference from Habakkuk? Because through inspiration, the quote here adds he. In Habakkuk, it's referred to as it, that it shall come. But now the writer to the Hebrews says that he shall come. And the he, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the word made flesh, not written on tables of stone, but on the te- fleshly tables of the heart, that he shall come, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and this is a theme that speaks to us strongly, doesn't it, throughout the scriptures. Ephesians 1 verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather all things together in one, in Christ. Psalm 102 verse 13, thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion for the time to favour her. Yea, the set time is come. And we don't know when that time is, but the vision cannot lie. It can't lie because of the one who's declared it. That almighty God has declared it and his son has declared it so it cannot lie it's an impossibility for it to lie so it will happen and there's a sense in this verse that whilst we have to wait for it that things are speeding up towards it one of our hymns that we sing is that the days are quickly flying and Christ will come again and how true that is brothers and sisters how often do we call it how quickly a year goes by one bible school to an X. We're now in 2024. Um, many of you, myself included, perhaps expected our Lord to come in the year 2000. And here we are 24 years later. 
But Habakkuk says it hastens into the end. It will not delay. And we can take great encouragement that as we draw closer to the return of Jesus, it's as if time itself speeds up. Can you come with me, please, to Matthew 24? Again, um, the words of our master um, in the Olivet Prophecy. Matthew 24 and verse 22 And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Now, I appreciate the the primary fulfilment here is to AD 70, but there's also a parallel to our time, that our days are being shortened, that events in the world are happening at an ever-increasing pace, just like the contractions of a woman in childbirth as the birth of the child gets that much closer. But we might ask, well, why does it tarry? Why hasn't Jesus returned? Well, we find the answer in those very well-known words in Peter's letter, don't we? That the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as so many count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And brothers and sisters, if Jesus had returned in 1917 or 1948 or 1967, how many of us in this room would have been baptised. If Jesus had returned in 2000, how many of our young people would have been baptised? Our Persian contacts. You see, we need to remember that the reason for the delay is for our benefit. It's because God is long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish. But the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end, it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Well, let's go back to Habakkuk chapter two. And before we get to that very famous phrase, the just shall live by his faith, we have a warning for us. And it's in verse four, Habakkuk chapter two, verse four. Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him. Now, the Hebrew words are lifted up here. Um, it's the Hebrew apal, and it means to swell or to presume. And it's a special word in the scriptures because it only occurs twice. And when a word only occurs twice in the scriptures, we're compelled to look at the, the other time that it is used. And the other time it's used is in Numbers chapter 14. Let's go there. Numbers chapter 14 is when Israel were on the edge of the promised land. They'd come out of Egypt and there they were within touching distance of it. They could see it. They were just outside of it. And you'll remember what happened in the lead up to uh, Numbers chapter 14, that they'd sent out the spies into the land to view the promised land, that land flowing with milk and honey. In type, they had viewed the kingdom. And you'll remember what happened with the report of the spies, that only two came back with a faithful report, Joshua and Caleb. And the 10 spies did not. They said that you couldn't go in. There were things in there that would, they wouldn't be able to overcome. And God hears about this and God is angry with his people. Verse 26 of Numbers chapter 14. The Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I've heard the murmurings of the children of Israel which murmur against me, saying to them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number, from 20 year olds and numbered, which have numbered, murmured against me. And so they were going to die in the wilderness. Why? Because they didn't believe. They had lost their faith. They listened to the 10 spies and not the two faithful spies. And so Israel were now in a terrible position just as they were about to enter into the land. It was there. They could could grasp it. But what did the people do? Well, they tried to take matters into their own hands. Verse 40 of Numbers 14. And they rose up early in the morning and got them up to the top of the mountain, saying, Lo, we be here and will go up unto the place which the Lord hath promised, for we have sinned. So they tried to go into the promised land 
themselves. What does Moses tell them? Well, verse 41, and Moses said, Wherefore now do you transgress the commandments of the Lord, but it shall not prosper? Go not up, for the Lord is not among you, that ye be not smitten before your enemies. So Moses said, don't do it. God's not with you. Verse 44, but they presumed, and that's our word apal in Habakkuk chapter 2. They presumed, they were lifted up to go into the hilltop. And then we're told, nevertheless, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Moses departed not out of the camp. And what was the consequence of this? Then the Amalekites came down and the Canaanites which dwelt in the hill and smote them and discomfited them even unto Hormah. They presumed to go out. They wouldn't wait for the vision. They wouldn't wait for God. They thought they could save themselves, brothers and sisters. And of course, it ended very badly for them. And the same will happen to us if we presume, if we are lifted up, if we think, We can save ourselves and not need God. Well, keep a marker in in numbers, please, and come back with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 10. Because we see something really interesting in Hebrews chapter 10. Because the quote continues from Habakkuk. (coughs) Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verse 38. The quote continues, Now the just shall live by faith, and we'll look at that in a moment. And then it goes on to say, if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. The ESV says, shrinks back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Now, this is the opposite of what Habakkuk's telling us. So Habakkuk was telling us that it's a swelling up, it's a presumptuousness. Well, the Hebrew writer, he's saying, if a man shrinks back, if he draws back, that that is a warning to us. So why is there a difference? Well, I think under inspiration, the writer to the Hebrews is drawing from the same incident in Numbers. Let's have a look at it. You see, the root cause of the problem for Israel is that of the unfaithful report of the 10 spies. And what did they see? And what did they say? Well, let's go back to Numbers chapter 13 and verse 32. The ten spies, and they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which they have gone up to search is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come out the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. See, they saw these huge giant men, and they said, in comparison, we're like grasshoppers. The 10 faithless spies, they'd shrunk back. They didn't think that they could overcome. And we know the giants, that they represent sin. They didn't think they could overcome the power of sin to get to the kingdom. And so they didn't believe, and they didn't go in. And so there's lessons for us here, brothers and sisters, If we think that we can save ourselves, if we act presumptuously, if we think we don't need God to get to the kingdom, then we will fail. And secondly, if we think that sin is so great, if the giants are so tall, and we don't believe that God through his son can overcome them, when we shrink back, that will prevent our entrance into the kingdom. So what do we need to do? Well, here we have the view from Mount Nebo, overlooking the promised land, the view that Moses would have seen before his death. That's what we need to be focusing on. And what does Habakkuk tell us? Well, back in Habakkuk chapter two, verse four, but the just shall live by his faith. That's what we need, isn't it? We need faith. That's the key. And again, there is a a difference. I don't know if you noticed, but in Hebrews Chapter 10, the quote that we read, it doesn't say the just shall live by his faith. The quote from Hebrews 10 says that the just shall live by faith. The his is missing. And the three other times that this passage is quoted in the New Testament, it's just faith. The just shall live by faith. The his is dropped. So why is that? Well, when Habakkuk gave the prophecy under inspiration, it was about 600 years before the Messiah, before his faith was seen by the world. And so it was necessary for his faith to come first, that he might overcome. So then our faith could follow. 
Let's go back to uh, Hebrews, this time Hebrews chapter 11, because um, I don't know if you've thought about the, the introduction, if you like, of that great chapter of faith, Hebrews chapter 11. The introduction is from Habakkuk, that the just shall live by faith. And then we've got this tremendous list of all those who have been faithful in the scriptures. And, and we commented yesterday about Habakkuk's name being here in verse 13, how he embraced them, the meaning of his name in verse 13. And we're told in verse 6 of Hebrews 11, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If we want to live, if we want to please God, if we want to be in the kingdom, it's vital that we have faith. This is central to the whole book of the scriptures, isn't it? And we've got this list of faithful of old in Hebrews 11 who have shown us the way. And if we were to say, well, who is the father of faith? Well, I'm sure our, our, our minds would immediately go to Abraham, wouldn't they? Verse 8 of Hebrews 11. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go into a place which he should have to receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. And so it's perhaps unsurprising that when we look at the other times that this phrase is used, the just shall live by faith. It's Abraham's faith that is highlighted. Let's have a look at it. Let's go to Galatians and chapter three. Let's see how this is brought out for us by the Apostle Paul. Galatians chapter three. And uh, we have a look at uh, verse six, uh, first of all, words that we are very familiar with. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him or imputed to him for righteousness. So this is all about the faith of Abraham. And then we have our quote from Habakkuk down in verse 11. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Now, have you ever considered how interchangeable these two phrases are? See, the just, quoting from Habakkuk, that's equivalent to the righteous, isn't it? That God you know, believed in God and God accounted to him for righteousness. And Abraham's belief is his faith. It's a formula. It's talking about the same thing. So the just shall live by faith is very similar to saying that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So the Jews, the descendants of Abraham, are saved not by the law, and that's the argument of Galatians, but by faith. And Abraham demonstrated that in his life. It was his belief that it was accounted to him as righteous so that he would live, and it's the same for us. So that's the Jews. But what about the Gentiles? Well, let's go to the other time this is quoted in Romans and chapter 1. Because Romans chapter 1 is, is all about faith amongst the nations, faith in the world, we might say. Um, let's just pick that up um, in verse 5 of Romans chapter 1, where we read, By whom we have received grace and apostleship and to obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. So it's the proclamation of the gospel. Uh, it's repeated again in verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken throughout the whole world. So again, there's this wider um, explanation. Verse 15, so as much as in me, I'm ready to preach the gospel to them as I at Rome also, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth. Note, to the Jew first and also to the Greek or the Gentile, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So there's an order here, isn't there, brothers and sisters? It's the faith of the Jews, the faith of Abraham, the faith of those recorded in Hebrews 11, from faith to faith that the Gentiles might also believe. So God's righteousness is shown by making the just that believe in faith. The just shall live by faith. And so the revelation to Habakkuk has far-reaching consequences, isn't it? It applied to the prophet, 
in his time, that he would live by faith. It applies to all the descendants of Abraham who have showed the same faith in their life. And it applies to us who are afar off, the Gentiles, called out to the nations to be a people for the name because of faith. So in our, our last few minutes, in our uh, time here this morning, brothers and sisters, let's just think about how is our faith? How is my faith? Do you see the return of our Lord and Master as something that's going to happen at some point? You want Jesus to return, but perhaps in your mind you're putting off the return of the Lord. You're putting off the nearness of our Lord's return. This year, in going around to various ecclesias and speaking at the Bible Hour, doing a, a talk on uh, the nearness of, of the coming of, of Jesus. And I've been um, asking the audience to do a, an online poll, asking them personally, when do you expect Jesus to return? Now, we know none of us know the day or the hour. It's just a personal opinion. When do you expect Jesus to return? And I put a multiple choice up and I asked the audience, do you expect Jesus to return in the next 12 months, in the next two to five years, five to 15 years, longer or never? You might like to mentally do the same thing this morning. Now, most of the audiences I've been speaking to are Christadelphians and Christadelphian children, and I'm, I'm glad to say that nobody's yet said that they don't expect Jesus to return, which is good. But the vast majority either put it in the two to five years or the five to 15 years, and only 5 to 7% of the audience have expected Jesus to return within the next 12 months. And I thought that was quite telling. Now, are we really a people on the edge of the promised land? Are we really expecting Jesus to return at any minute? Do we live in anticipation that today might be our last day, that we might be taken away to the judgment at any moment? Now, maybe we're struggling to see ourselves in God's kingdom. Maybe we're having problems in our lives that we're thinking will prevent us from getting to God's kingdom. Maybe the giants of sin in our lives are looming so great that perhaps we don't think that God and the power of forgiveness through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, can overcome them. Are we shrinking back? Or are we subconsciously forgetting about God and acting in a way that suggests that we think we can save ourselves, acting presumptuously. Come with me please to Luke chapter 21 because Jesus gives us a warning doesn't he with regards to his coming. Luke chapter 21 <coughs> verse 34 Jesus tells us <clears throat> and take heed to yourselves Lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unawares. And I suggest that being overcharged, and that's a bit like acting presumptuously, that the things of this world are taking over us and we're forgetting about the things of God. Uh, and that's a real danger that all of us need to be aware of. But for our final passage this morning, please turn with me, please, to First of John and chapter 5 because what we need to focus on is the faith that's required isn't it it's through faith that we are saved faith in him faith in the outworking of God's plan and purpose and here we have some wonderful words that we can take as encouragement for us 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4 for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world and this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith so that's what we must focus on brothers and sisters in cultivating that faith in our lives to living our lives as demonstrating that faith that we have and so the just shall live by faith even so come Lord Jesus